um, Pullman Police Advisory Meeting. Uh, we're happy to have everyone here and everyone watching. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with attendance. And what we usually do is we go around and say, you know, our representation in a roll call. Traditionally, I've been really bad at getting us to do roll call because then I just say, hey, we've been uh, we do it during our constituencies poll at the end. We also have a lot of people that roll in. But why don't we start by introducing ourselves and we'll start at, down at the end here. So David Macon, I'm the Multicultural Representative Alternative. Mm -hmm. Adam Williams, I am the Sunnyside Alternate. Amir al I represent the Graduate and Professional Students Association at WSU. Angie Center, WSU faculty staff representative. Stephanie Rink, Pullman School District parent and vice chair. Corey Woodley, chair, chairwoman. Eric Tesla, business community. Phyllis, <coughs> excuse me, Phyllis Stallcop, uh, Sunnyside Hill. And believe it or not, we actually have a really full committee. It's just for some reason today, daylight savings, really sunny outside. It was just a good day not to come. <laughs> but we have a great presentation. It is going to be recorded, so it will be available. Please share it on your guys' Facebooks. Make it available to people you know in your community after, after the presentation is over and, and posted. Uh, but we're going to start off today by uh, reviewing the meeting minutes from the January 14th meeting. Did everyone get a chance to look at a copy of those meeting minutes? I'm wondering did we actually skip both of those? It's still October 2019. It was moved the December uh, meeting. Let's see. Okay. So. So uh, I don't believe we have a quorum, so we probably won't be able to vote on the minutes. Um, um, so it's 50% of representation, yeah. Okay. I think we'll need one more person. Oh, yeah. So we have, um, if we don't count the Pullman High School student one, that we're both are vacant. We have 13 positions, and we have six uh, six that constituencies are represented. Yeah. Okay. Well, if we have a few more people walk in, we can always uh, look at these. Like rich. Yeah. We can <laughs> if we have a couple people from a different area. So we will have to we'll have to review these at the end of our meeting today. If that's okay with everybody. So the agendas do look a little different. I don't know if you guys noticed that they were posted differently. Darby sent a link. It's actually uh, all posted under the city um, webpage. I believe all the boards are now posting in this manner. So you have access to everything in one easy place, which is nice. Uh, but we're going to start off with the Whitman County Coroner's presentation by Annie Pillars. A very exciting presentation that we've had to reschedule a few times, but everyone's on the edge of their seat to hear from, from her. So uh, we really appreciate you being here. And welcome. Thank you very much. I actually missed your January meeting because I had an unexpected death in my family. So the reason I tell you that is as we serve, we are served in this world. That's just the nature of the lives that we live. So I just wanted you to know that. And of course, we all missed February because of the snow. I did just want to start out and give some basic information about the coroner's office. And I tend to talk softly. So if you need me to talk louder, please tell me that. Um, I also want to say I appreciate being invited. Um, honestly, often it's hard to talk about what the coroner's office does, but I actually think it makes it easier when we all know and understand who's doing that and what those roles are. I have been in the coroner capacity uh, pr just a little over a year now, March 1st, after Pete Martin retired. And right after that, Gary and I met the chief and just talked about our roles and what we do, and we find that to be very useful. I've uh, been at the office about 10 years now, but one year in the coroner's role. So I will start with what I've got, and then I would just love for your questions, and you're absolutely welcome to ask them during the presentation as well. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to IT for getting this all set up for us. It's pretty slick. So the office actually was established in 1981. And what's interesting and why I say that to you is um, across our country, there's a whole variety of coroner and medical examiner um, protocols and how they operate and how they function in different states. So in our state, if you are um, under a population of 40,000, it's the prosecuting attorney that is the coroner. So our surrounding neighbors, for example, Asotin County, it's the prosecuting attorney that does death investigations because they have a really good background in investigations. Um, off 
um, counties over 40,000 become elected coroners, and that's what happened in Whitman County in 1981. They hit the 40,000 mark. And then when you get way in um, much higher than that, for example, in Spokane County, you have medical examiners. So there are six medical examiners in the state of Washington, Tacoma, Seattle, Snohomish, Spokane as some, some examples. So here we are a coroner elected, elected county. Our focus is absolutely on really providing compassionate care, doing a thorough investigation, and helping families understand what happened to their person. In essence, um, the cause and manner of that death, uh, and typically their unexpected deaths. Once in a while, they may know that their person is really <coughs> sick, but they didn't expect them to die necessarily on that day. So that's what our entire focus is, is cause and manner of death. So the role of our job is if it's um, sudden or unexpected. And um, what that simply means is we didn't expect it now. If it's accidental, so any accidental deaths in Whitman County, whether it's a car wreck or a, a farm accident, the coroner's office is going to work in conjunction with uh, local law enforcement. If it's suspicious or homicide, suspicious, maybe there is a drug issue involved and they're not sure what happened, um, or we simply don't know yet. And then unattended, and I really want to talk about that just for a second because there's often confusion about that. So normally when we think of unattended, that means you're by yourself maybe. But in, in the coroner's role, unattended means that there wasn't an attending physician overseeing the disease process. So often you'll see in the hospital setting, the attending physician was um, Dr. Hall. So that's what they talk about when it's attended versus unattended. And that's very confusing for families sometimes. It doesn't mean that you're alone, okay? It just means that there was an attending physician. So cause of death is really basically going to be twofold. It's, off, it's either going to be a disease process, cancer, stroke, heart attack, or it can be a sudden event, a motor vehicle accident, a farm accident, um, a shooting. You know, it can be anything that's outside of the disease process. So for us, we have to determine cause, and then we have to determine manner. And so they're slightly different. Manner is natural, which again is typically a disease process, a homicide, suicide, accidental, and undetermined. And I cannot think the last time Whitman County has had an undetermined um, manner of death. What that means is that through the entire uh, initial investigation, review of medical records, perhaps an autopsy, it is uh, unable to determine the cause of that death. It, that is so rare, so, so rare, and even more rare in Whitman County. But just so you know, that is an option that um, if you cannot determine anything else, you would put undetermined for that death. The um, point to that would be even later, let's say five or ten years later, more information comes in, they may be able to change that from undetermined to what the actual cause was. But again, in our case, it's rarely happening in Whitman County. So how do we determine cause and manner? It's really the totality of the situation. It's both what we do on scene, and this is where we tag team regularly with the police department. So for example, last week I was out here twice in the same day in Pullman. And I want to say right off the bat to you, um, one of the things I appreciate about the Pullman Police Department, there's so many things, and not, not one thing. One of the first things I appreciate is when I arrive on scene, they know the name of the person, they know who the family is, if the family is present, they know a little bit of history, they will tell me that information when we arrive. And they have gotten to know that person, even if it's in a half hour. They actually care about the people, they take time to talk to them. And I will tell you, this is not why people get into law enforcement, is to, to coordinate with the coroner's office. But what we see over and over with the Pullman Police Department, from the line officers to the detectives, is people that care. They take time. They're with that family. They will help us if we need help. It's just incredible. So we're very thankful for that. And I will tell you, that's not what you necessarily see across the state sometimes. Sometimes there's a, not a good. Um, not good cooperation, and I think that's not serving our families well, so we're very lucky here. So in addition, we'll review medical history. Sometimes that comes from family, and we'll review medical records. So we will be getting medical records from the hospital, maybe Palouse Medical, or if their medical office is long distance away, we'll fax and get that information. 
we'll review personal and social history. So why would that be important to us? We look to see what has changed for that person in the last time. Are they, did they used to be very active and now they're not as active as they used to be? Has there been a change in how they're living? What kind of work did they do? That can impact their death. Um, just the changes that we see going on for them. In autopsies, we um, typically don't have to do a lot of autopsies. Autopsies are if we're unable to determine that cause and manner through our investigation. Um, autopsies are not easy. They're, they can be very hard on families, and we talk to them about why we're doing that and why the, the importance of that, because our job is to determine cause and manner. And if we can't do that, then we're going to go to an autopsy. Um, but often people think that we're doing autopsies on every case, and it's not needed on every case. So just for you to be aware of that. So this is helpful if you have folks that um, are just wondering what it works and how it works. So what's supposed to happen if there's been an unexpected death, whether it's at home or at work or someplace else, they would call 911 and say that there has been a death or they were, they're going to call for the ambulance. They're going to dis dispatch both the ambulance and law enforcement at the same time. So in Pullman, you're going to see Pullman Fire and Pullman Police Department come. Um, when ready, they're going to request the coroner's office. And then, um, as appropriate, they might look for a chaplain or a pastor or maybe a good friend to come sit with that person. That always gets offered. And again, it's amazing because it gets offered long before we arrive. We think that's really important to start that process, to have someone sit with that person. So that's the first part that happens. They need to call in, and then law enforcement and the ambulance come. When we arrive on scene, we're going to actually talk with next of kin. We're going to talk with law. We're going to talk with fire and others on scene just to get the initial information. What just happened now? Why are we here today? And they're going to work with us through that. We're going to get, again, information on the situation, medical history, if it was a car wreck. Were they the driver? Were they the passenger? What was happening? We're going to take photos, and um, when we go into homes, we take photos as well, and we always tell our families that. We tell them everything that we're going to do so that they understand what's happening. We're going to collect medical records on scene. If they have been to the hospital recently and they have discharge documents, we'll pick up those discharge papers. Really helpful for us in determining what's going on. Um, we're also going to take personal property. So for example, if they have a wallet and it's in their back pocket, that will go with us initially to the funeral home. And why do we take wallets? For a couple of reasons. One, we actually have to identify the person. And we do that when we can through government identification. So if that's in their wallet, we're going to have that. The other thing that we find a lot of in wallets and purses is um, like cards for their next doctor's appointment. And if we don't have medical records, oh, now we know that they were seeing Dr. Foss back. And so we can call and talk to Dr. Foss back. All of that will come back to family when the investigation is over. So they'll get an inventory of everything that was in the wallet, and it'll go back to that family. One of the things that we find really important for families is the uh, driver's license. It's very personal to them. And so we really reassure them that that's going to come back to them. So again, I think I talked about personal property, jewelry, wallets, identification. Um, I guess I've kind of said all this. I'm ahead of myself, aren't I? The other thing that we do is we review medications on scene, and we collect all narcotics. And the reason that we collect the narcotics is that we don't want them to go into the normal stream in the community. So we take all the opiates that are in the house. We might not take all the blood pressure medicines, but we look to see how they've been taking those, because medications tell us a whole bunch of things. Sometimes um, not taking a medication can make us very, very sick. And so we look to see, are you taking your medication properly? I think often we think it's overtaking medication, but actually under underutilizing a medication can also make you sick. So that's really valuable information for us. So we work with that. And then if there is any evidence, so we work very much in tandem with law enforcement on this. Um, if there is something that we need, and let's say it potentially is a criminal case, typically law enforcement is going to take that information, but we might have information or uh, evidence that's on that person that's going to go with us. So just so that you're, again, it can be a criminal case at times. 
This is a really important one, and this is again where our law enforcement here in Pullman does a great job. We did this again just the other day twice. Um, we are obligated to notify um, the next of kin. That's one of our legal responsibilities. Oftentimes, the families that we're serving in Whitman County might not be from here. Um, they may be here visiting someone. They may be a student here. And family might live in Seattle or Florida. So what we have found is our law enforcement here can work with law enforcement in the other jurisdiction and start getting notification made. And so across our country, there's a fabulous chaplaincy program. And in Whitman County and in Pullman, Pullman has Matt McNelly as their chaplain. And we've used Matt many times and Matt and I have gone to private residences or businesses together and made notification but law enforcement and the chaplain through their department can contact the chaplains or the law enforcement and other agencies we feel that by far the most important thing to do is do that one-on-one -on -one. personally someone needs to go to that house once in a blue moon that doesn't happen and that's really hard on a family and so law enforcement and the coroner's office works very hard to make that happen in person um, and again we partner with chaplaincy and law enforcement it, it goes very very well so I mentioned Matt McNelly is the police chaplain here. He's also, is he the fire chaplain? Chief, I don't, maybe, I think it's Ron McMurray, isn't it? Yeah. So Ron does Whitman County area and Matt does here in Pullman. And then Corey Lahery, who's out of Palouse, does Palouse and Garfield area. And they have backup when they can, but sometimes they can't always be there and we're aware of that. Um, but Matt and I, um, he's just been fabulous. He knows the community. He knows many, many of the families here. And and I think Matt actually probably helps the police department sometimes, the officers. And it's about taking care of everybody on scene because, you know, I hope that each death diminishes us a little bit. It's a person and it's, it's hard and we all acknowledge that. And if you do this long enough, you just need someone to maybe listen to you once in a while. And Matt's one of those great people for that. The other thing that's really hard for families, and we always talk to them about this, what we're doing on scene and what's going to happen next. So in Whitman County, if we are here in Pullman and we have a case, we're going to take that person initially to Kimball Funeral Home. If we're in the Colfax area, they're going to go to Bruning Funeral Home. That doesn't preclude the family from doing whatever's best to honor their person. So once we finished our work, family can take their person wherever is the best to honor them and do what's right for that person. So we let them know that. Um, and we make sure that they have the phone number and we give them the name of Bob here in Colfax or Craig in, in um, excuse me, Bob here in Pullman or Craig in Colfax. It's, they just need to know who has their person. That's really important. So right now in our office, I'm the uh, full-time elected position. We have three people that are uh, on call if we need them, and they do a great job. Corey, or Scotty Anderson has been with the department longer than I have. He's been there about 13 years. I've been there about 10. And then we have two new folks. Uh, Laura Lautenslager is out of Roselia, and Dylan Keller is out of the Colton area. Uh, they all have a background either in EMS, uh, medical clinics, uh, investigations. So um, a nice mix of folks is what we have for the department. And then we want to be clear, we never do this by ourselves. First of all, initially, we're working really with dispatch initially, aren't we, to get the basic information. And they are a really good resource about telling us what to expect, if family might be on scene. And then we work with our law enforcement. We work with Washington State Patrol if it's a state highway our chaplaincy, and then, of course, hospice in our clinics and um, our funeral directors and our forensic pathologist. Our pathologist comes out of Seattle, and uh, he's a board-certified forensic pathologist. So I have worked with him for many years now, very good man. So I would open it up to questions if you would like to ask things that I didn't cover deeply enough or just things that you would like to know. Um. My my one one of my questions yeah. is how come you don't think that the coroner's office and law enforcement work well together in other areas? Oh, it's just sometimes that they are they they are 
pressed to get things done. And sometimes they, we are small enough that we know each other well. I know them in the grocery store. They know me in the grocery store. And there's just a nice partnership that occurs is what we have happening. And that just isn't always the case. We have different focuses, and I think we're very respectful of that. The chief and his officers and the detectives, they have a slightly different role than we do, but we recognize that, and when we go into a scene together, we talk about who's doing what first, what next. We don't move things without checking with the other. Just that nice, smooth relationship that's important, again, for serving that family the best. Yes. Really, first-rate presentation. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, how, uh, how bad is the opioid uh, crisis in Whitman County? You know, um, we're pretty blessed in the sense that um, we have also a very incredible um, EMS service in Whitman County, and often they get to them quickly and can. Um, provide assistance and they, there is not a death involved in that. We do get opioid deaths every year, but it's not um, as bad as one would think it would be. Yeah, yeah. But because we're seeing a huge change, one of the things that we're seeing change that, which we're so thankful for, and, and again, um, the Chief's Department has that as well, is called Narcan. And Narcan is a medication that they give to you if you, they think you're having an opioid overdose. And um, that saves lives. And it's been proven many, many, and saves lives here in Whitman County. So we're very blessed that we're not seeing them get all the way to death. And we're thankful for that. Um. I'm curious, and you sort of touched on this slightly and to some degree, but um, say you have a death that's suspicious that would be investigated, potential criminal or anything like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with pot things that are potential evidence, say, in court versus you? Right. Versus so police? again, we're going to work in conjunction with law enforcement on that. You know, if it's something on the person, it's going to go with us. But if there, you know, uh, if there's other things in the house, um, for example, if there's drugs in the house, that's going to go with law enforcement. You know, so we we very carefully make sure that we're working through that, and that's really important because we our job is getting it right for families, both of our roles, right? And so, collection of evidence is critical. And often we just make sure we know who has what. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes we use the word evidence differently than, let's say, the police department does. We might have evidence, again, that is use or uh, overuse or underuse of a medication. That's evidence for us in determining cause and manner, but it's not evidence in terms of a crime, right. if that makes sense to you. Yeah. If um, someone passes away at home, say, of a sudden heart attack yeah. in bed, and um, do you take the wallet and all of the medications and stuff as, as well as if Yes, yeah, so if they're at home and it, it oftentimes, you know, they're dressed and have their wallets in their pocket or right next to them, it, would, it will go with us. There's a little bit of flexibility in that, you know, but we will take the narcotics. We don't take all the medications. We look at those medications, but yes, wallets, rings, jewelry, you know, that it all is going to go with us initially, but it will come back to family if it's, if it's with them. Yeah, and, and that's actually tough, and we talk to our families about that, and we talk why we're taking that wallet. And, you know, because sometimes there's something in somebody's wallet that they just didn't know. They, were, they had an appointment coming, or, you know, sometimes um, they're just independent, you know, and maybe it's, a, it's your grandfather, and he doesn't tell you everything, you know, and so the wallet gives us more medical history sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So just a quick question on, I, I never really thought about, you know, how social media and a public oh. presence has changed the career in a sense as a coroner and uh, what is the line between physical evidence and doing, you know, background check evidence on like social media and things like that um, and when did, the, when, at what point do you turn things over to investigative uh, if you have suspicious? Well, let's talk. I'm going to break it into a couple of areas. You asked several questions. You probably didn't know you asked several questions or brought up several topics. My first one is just in general social media. And um, we work really hard to make sure that notification gets to family personally. Sometimes we can't beat a text. We can't beat Facebook. Um, and that's really hard. And um, more so when we see that as if it's an accident. 
and the person that's taking a picture of a car doesn't think about that. That's that's not on there. They're just trying to say, hey, this is a bad area. There's a big traffic accident here or something. And sometimes a picture of a vehicle will get out on social media. That's really hard because the first time the family hears about it is when they see it on Facebook. Doesn't happen often, but once is too often, right? You know, so that's really, really difficult. Um, when we're working a case before we leave, we're in tandem with law enforcement on what what do we have so far? What do we think it is so far? Is there any uh, any possibility of suspicious nature going on here? So we start that long before we leave. Um, if we take as a as a coroner's office. Um, any kind of um, electronics, again, let's say a computer or a phone. The reason that we're doing that is, again, twofold. Our whole focus is to compassionately serve you and to determine cause and manner. So we take that to, let's say, um, particularly if it's been a number of days, we're looking for the last time that person might have used the phone or used the computer. So we're looking to determine time, the last time they were alive, or um, their mindset. You know, they may have um, been searching for something on the website, or they wrote a, a letter on the in on their computer. So we're taking that for that purpose. It always goes back to the family. If we were to find something criminal on a phone or on the computer in a case that we didn't expect that, we would be contacting the agency that we worked with because we don't take anything off those computers. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's we're looking for the last time they used it, what they were doing with it, and it goes back to the family. So that's a great several questions there for you. Well, it maybe yeah. has broadened the job and making each case take longer, especially if you have those huh. complexities or... I think you've been following us around because 10 years ago, it, it, it's much more complicated now than it used to be because we have more available to us. But also, we probably can get more answers, too. But the, the trick with that is it takes longer, and, and people are hoping for answers sooner. You know, that's just the nature of it, isn't it? Because things are so instant. But sometimes it takes time to determine all the things that are happening. One thing I realized I didn't mention, and it's not even on there, is we do toxicology as well. So we are going to take specimens and test them for drugs and alcohol and um, in Washington State when I first started it was three weeks to get toxicology back now it's about six months and the reason it takes six months number one there's more people in um, Washington State but also because of the um, necessity to be testing for um, marijuana THC and that's just to slow things down so we're, you're starting to see coroner offices and medical examiners go to a private lab to get talks back more quickly when there's a real Im important need for that. So again, that takes time. And sometimes if we're waiting for talks, so let's say we have a potential that it's a drug case and it's an accidental death perhaps, we can't finish that. We have to put pending until we get talks back. So we will let the state talks lab know that this is pending. And if you can, if you can bump us up a little bit in the queue, then we try to get that done sooner. And then we report all that back to our law enforcement agency. Agency. So when we're working with the detectives here and we have a pending like that, once we get talks back, we relay all that back to them so they know the final determination. Why pending is important is twofold. Again, it's about serving our families well. When you put pending on a death certificate, it allows the family to move forward with how they're going to honor their person. But it also allows us to get that final piece of information to list the, because um, for statistical purposes, if it's a drug-related death, they uh, need us to put down what kind of drug it was. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. My turn again. Huh. <laughs> um, so I have two questions, but I'll ask one, and then we'll go to Adam. <laughs> so could you just explain what the difference is between a medical examiner and a coroner? So medical examiners are um, hired. So they are um, appointed, in essence, to their county. And they are forensic pathologists. Coroners in uh Washington State typically have a background e either in law enforcement or medical, but they don't have to. So anybody could be elected coroner. 
you don't see that anymore. That was much more common a long, long time ago. So for example, in our office, both Scotty and I are nationally accredited. It takes many years to get national accreditation and it takes testing. And then you have to do a lot of continuing education. Our two new people, Laura and Dylan, are working towards national accreditation, but you have to have 600 hours of being in the field and, and they're not there yet. So you're seeing that national accreditation going across the state. But again, that's in our state, MEs versus coroners. In other states across our country, it's sometimes a combined ME coroner office. There's sort of some combinations of things. So just to follow up, do you work with a physician to do autopsies? Yes, our autopsies are by the forensic pathologist oh. who comes out of Seattle. And in fact, oh, he's a fabulous person. He was, for many years, the ME medical examiner for Snohomish County. A real good guy. Yeah. Yeah, so he, I wouldn't be qualified to do the autopsies themselves. I assist at them, but you use a forensic pathologist is what you do, and that's what we do here in Whitman County. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, I'll ask mine <laughs> next. <laughs> we have a, quite a few international uh, people mm -hmm. in this county, so mm -hmm. what kind of compl like complexities would have be different or yeah. incorporated when you have an international person that passes? Yeah. We regularly serve folks from all spectrums of life, and I think the first way to do that right is to start with that they're just a person that's grieving. I, grief is such a universal um, equalizer uh, for all of us. You can see it in people's faces. Um, it's about connecting from where they are. If there's a language issue, then we're going to call an interpreter in if, if we need to do that. Um, but often, what people are looking for is just answers, and we tell them everything that we're doing next. So we actually, Adam, honestly, isn't that something we have just not had a problem with that at all, because we go where they are. We simply go with where they are in that moment. Um, sometimes where that becomes difficult, in no matter um, whether we're international or regional or across our country national, uh, nationwide, is anytime you have to have a discussion over the phone, it's always harder no matter, you know, and so um, once in a while we'll find that when our family lives someplace else and it doesn't matter whether, again, it's international or not, we just take our time and walk with them through what we're talking about. Yeah, good question. Yeah, we've had family pass away uh, overseas and yes. it was incredibly difficult yeah. going the other way around. Yeah, no, so I'm glad you brought that up too. Let me talk about that. We are so lucky here. So for example, our funeral homes here regularly work to get people from overseas back here and vice versa. People that might live in another country outside the United States, get them back to their families. It's more common than you think it is actually right here in Whitman County. And it happens all the time in the funeral homes across the world and the funeral homes right here work really well together. It, it makes it more complicated, but they do a great job. Yeah. Okay, so my next question. <laughs> um, so can you just tell us how you got into this career? You know, I will tell you how I got into this <laughs> career. Uh, about 20 years ago, I started out as an EMT. And when you're young and you're first new at something, you're, you're just so convinced you're going to save everybody because that's what you get to do. And then you realize that maybe that's not the privilege you have as an EMT, but the privilege you have is being available for families. And I learned that pretty early as an EMT. And at the same time, I got into hospice work. So for 20 years now, my entire life has been about um, <coughs> some level of grief, loss, and death. And it's changed who I am. I, I am shaped in a way I would not have expected by this work. And um, about 10 years ago, a person that was leaving the coroner's office said to Pete Martin, you should talk to Annie Pillars. And I'm really glad he did. It's very privileged work. And if I would have known 30 years ago, I would have started then. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. One more question back related to the international. How do you, how do you deal with notifying, say, families that are international? That yeah, again, a, a little more complicated. And, and, but. Law enforcement works with law enforcement all across the world, and so we're going to work the same thing with chaplaincies and law enforcement across the world to do that. And you know, the world is just so incredibly connected nowadays, it's, it's easier to do that than it used to be. 
And I'm guessing that probably you're running out of time, aren't you, Chief? So I don't want to keep you too long. But yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Great questions, you guys. I have to say, I really appreciate that. Great I, presentation. Oh, yes, thank very you very good. much. Do we yeah. have questions from audience? Yeah. Okay. I got another question. Okay. Um, if there's cold cases and there's turnover in the coroner's office, are there, I don't know if there are cold cases or not, but unsolved murders or whatever, um, does that transition from coroner to coroner? Yes. Or does it stay with the yes. Any any case that that's not completed. Well, is always, it doesn't matter who the coroner is per se, that would stay with the coroner's office till it's resolved. So for example, it's very rare, I mean incredibly rare, where we can't find family. And um, you don't sleep well when you can't find family because you know somebody loves that person. So, and I believe that the um, police department works with this as well, it's called NamUs. And so uh, un unidentified or missing or unclaimed law enforcement is part of that, coroner's office is part of that. And I think the longest one I can remember, it took me two years. And then another one a couple years ago was a family from Russia, and that was really complicated. I actually worked with a lovely professor at WSU who did um, interpreting. We had to put it in English writing, and she put it in Russian, and we sent it back and forth to a family till we found that family. And um, that felt good because that family wanted to know. So if, if that's typically what might happen, but we're talking one in 10 years where we aren't able to make fine family right of way, but we don't give up. Yeah. Annie, what do you have to do to get medical records from a hospital or a doctor's office? Yeah, that's a great question, too. So um, there are uh, Washington Administrative Codes and RCWs that actually allow coroner's offices, medical examiners for death investigations. We have right to that because our focus is, again, to determine cause and manner. So um, often we have, it outside of Whitman County, because they don't know us, Chief, we have to um, just put in a records request, but we have this really long, you know, small type with two different sections that give them the assurance that they're allowed to give that to us because that is, can, can be unnerving. And I always compliment and regularly here, let's say they'll get a new person at the Palouse Medical Group or Pullman Family Medicine and they'll say, well, who you are, I need your ID and you got to sign this. I'm like, good, you did your job, nice work. But we, we, we can have access to that. Yeah, just for that purpose only, so. Don't ever ask me that. That's a great one. <laughs> so I have one more quick question. Maybe it's not so quick. But so at what point do you decide you need the forensic pathologist to come in? You and know, it's pretty straightforward, really. If it's suspicious at all, if it's a homicide, we're going to do a forensic pathologist uh, autopsy. If we cannot determine cause and manner based upon the totality of the circumstances, that person's past history and medical records, then we're going to do an autopsy. Okay. Yeah. And then it, it's really pretty, it's pretty straightforward really. What information do you give the forensic pathologist coming in? Right. Do you show them any of your background investigative stuff? Oh, absolutely. Because if, if the pathologist was to do that by themselves, it wouldn't be as complete. It's, for example, you know, we're going to talk about what law enforcement saw on scene, what we saw on scene, what changed, what we heard from um, people that were on the scene, background information. So it's absolutely in tandem. It um, makes for a much more complete investigation. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't know if people would claim bias if, if there was um, text messages about suicide or something and right. uh, then they, right. they missed indicators of right. a murder because they were focused on what they had seen in the prior content. I didn't know if you guys were worried about those kind of confirmation biases. So again, you know, when we look at our phones for cause and manner, we would be looking for that as well. Absolutely. Yes. And what we have found typically is that um, we spend time talking with families and listening to them as to what they saw was changing in their person. And then as we get information, we share that with them. And I think that helps a bunch. Yeah. Andy, does body-worn camera video ever 
enter into your use for your investigation? Right. So we don't use body cameras, obviously, because we don't need to. But where we have found it to be useful, it's a great question, too, is um, sometimes EMS might be the first persons on scene. And um, we need to know what the situation or the scene was before anything's been moved. And absolutely, rightfully so, EMS needs to do things. And so things get changed a lot. And so um, we might look at that. We typically don't need that. Um, but that actually has been helpful to determine what the situation was before things got changed. Yeah. I do know that, of course, your officers are using that too, yes. I didn't know EMT or... You're, you're an elected official? How long are your terms? They're four-year terms. Four yeah. Just curious. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, absolutely. Yeah, four-year terms. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to circle back because it's just been rolling in my head about the, you said the pending status? It can be six months for the toxicology lab? Because right. Because of the legalization of marijuana. And yeah, that has slowed things up quite a bit, right. So if someone is, if they're in a pending status, the way they want to handle the body is in cremation. Yeah, they're, able, they're to able to do that. Oh, now. right. They don't have to wait until the pending is resolved. That's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's when we talk with families about that. And again, our percentage of that is also really, really small. Really, really small. Yeah. So yeah. How often in Whitman County do we have to do you have to use a private facility versus going to the state Um we only started doing that about six months ago and I would say five percent of the time it's not a lot yet right so in in Washington State they have a sense of humor and it's called whack me <laughs> it's the Washington Association of coroners and medical examiners um, great group of folks truly and uh, one of the things they have done is worked out a um, much better fee schedule for Washington State coroners and medical examiners and that has been really appreciated and helpful yeah, the state tox lab is doing all they can to improve that. They have uh, they've, they've got some scientists that are in training now. Um, but again, as we talked about earlier, just the expectations are different, and more things are, are needed than used to be, and there's more to test for. Yeah. Okay. What and if you can't find a family in two, three years, what happens to that person? Yeah. So uh, eventually, and I haven't had to face that, but eventually. Um, so what? typically will happen, number one, earlier than later, um, and this is really hard, they will um, be cremated, and then they will stay at the funeral home, and we have a log of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, coroners across the state have sometimes big, big departments. They have many people waiting for somebody. And again, I every, ex every death investor I've ever talked to, that's probably the thing that bothers us the most, is not being able to find family. Yeah, it's really hard. Thank you for asking. Yeah. So if ours is at six months right now for toxicology reports mm -hmm. to come back, how does that compare to other states or national? Oh, I, I, I have, I just, honestly, I don't know. Okay. I've never had to check that out. I think you're going to see that change again, like I said, because they're sure. doing some training of sure. uh, scientists. But yes, yeah. And they know it, too. They're working hard at that. Yeah. But it is hard for families. It's a long time to wait and sometimes, yeah. Yeah. So along that line, um, so a family can go and cremate their loved one, yeah. but so you take all the tissue samples and all that kind of stuff? We do everything ahead of time. That's okay. correct. We, so we do all that. So then if it comes back, like it's a homicide, then you already have everything there? Yeah. If it's homicide, it's, it, again, it will be pending until we get talks back. We'll probably send that to a private lab. That's what we've, and you know, fortunately, in my time, we've had two homicides in, in 10 years. So we don't get a lot of those, but in a homicide, everything slows down. Everybody takes their time. Nothing's not done without being in coordination. And um, there's always an autopsy. There's tissues taken at autopsy and everything else. And then um, they can, that person can be honored as best, but we will have everything we need to finalize all that information. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So in your opinion, if someone does die of homicidal violence, would you suggest that person not be cremated just in case future things come back? Right. You know, after we've finished our thorough exam and we've worked in tandem with our law enforcement, we've never had to do that. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's why I said we slow down. Everybody gets to all the things they need done first. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you so much yeah. and for letting us drill you with questions oh, no. today. And I thank you kinda... for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share. I'm going to leave these, Gary, can I? For Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Very, 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 very helpful very information. Very interesting. Now, if I'm not mistaken, we do make corn now. Yes, we do now. Okay, yes. making sure I'm counting correctly here. So if you guys don't mind, we're just going to rewind really quickly and look at those meeting minutes. Did anyone have any comments on those? I remember, though, that I was not presiding because I was so upset that she was going to be presenting in the January one. Yes. And then when I found out that she had to reschedule, I was quite excited. So, that so Corey was presenting. Yes. So yeah. we should get that corrected then. Yes. They have to be changed. Um, when was our previous meeting prior to January? December. December. It was mo moved to the so third or something? Isn't, wouldn't this be, did we approve two me minutes or wouldn't this be changed December 2? Unless we have to ask. Instead of October. Maybe. Well, yeah, unless we yeah. approve both. We approved both. I think we did do, approve, do both. Okay. Yes. So I will uh, add to October and December's meeting minutes. Because I think we did skip November. And thus, um, we skipped something in there. <laughs> I thought Darby might have put those on top in that box. Gary, did you see Which anything month? Uh, from Darby meeting minutes I need to sign? It's usually in a yeah. Here's December. Is that yeah, what I'm looking for? Yeah, I just want to make sure those are both signed. December is signed. Okay. All right. So yep. October. Um, Stephanie actually signed December. Yeah. Which is right because Stephanie was yeah because I was. Doing oh yes. December. yes. Yeah. Wait. But if you signed the December minutes, those wouldn't be here until January. This was from the January meeting. Yeah, she just, she no. signed them January 14th. The December, that means she was presiding. In December, yes. No. But she, be, the presiding person is supposed to sign it from the previous meeting? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> we'll have it changed. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm fully understanding. Uh, so I see two changes so far. Uh, on page two, we're going to have... Darby add to December meeting minutes from October 2018 and December 2018 approved. I think I initially signed December and I think then she signed them. I remember signing them and then having to have them resigned, but I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, and then, but it doesn't really matter. We can approve meeting yeah, minutes whatever. either person with, even if we weren't at the meeting. Uh, and then, so going on to, where was the other? Well, just first page and second page. And then you on the first that. page, it was you myself, Corey Woodley. Yeah, because Billy over there. So. Okay, so we can go ahead and approve these meeting minutes with changes. Oh. With accepted yeah. changes, if you want, or we can I'll change. Make a motion, I guess. I'll make a motion to approve them as second. change. As second. change. <laughs> okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. So I will have those updated and sign this at the next meeting. So. All right, so we'll go right on to our constituencies polls. This oh. should be... Did I miss something? Oh, you know, <laughs> Chief, I think I've skipped over you twice today. <laughs> I think I skipped over your introductions, and then I'm quit forgetting our police department update, but Chief Jenkins, please, uh, can you provide us the... I wasn't going to complain. I know, you were probably there, and he was like, hey, let's get out of here, this is great. So first I'll update you on where we are uh, with recruitment and staffing. Um, we are authorized 33 positions. Uh, we currently have um, actually... 29 filled, but some of those are in the academy, so I'll go through some of these. 
Um, so Holden Humphrey graduated from the Academy January 9th. And then um, Love St. Andre graduated last week, March 6th. And then we uh, sent three uh, people to the Spokane Academy uh, starting February 12th. That's Brianna Banks, Alyssa Kate, and Ashley Lamb. Ashley had been a code enforcement officer and was records before that. So they're due to graduate June 18th. So that actually brings us to 29. And so we have four more to hire to reach 33. Um, so we are doing continuous police officer recruitment. Uh, we do have a, a w recruitment web page up that's called servepullman.com and specifically for um, recruitment. Uh, we did have interviews January 23rd and 24th. Uh, Stephanie sat in on those interviews and we uh, I've already conducted a few chief's interviews following those and we, we have backgrounds and progress on three of those people at the moment and we have a few people left on that list. Um, we are also planning to hold uh, more interviews in April, April 23rd and 24th. Uh, as you may recall, we switched from using national testing network to public safety testing for all of our pre-employment testing and uh, so we're using public safety testing as of January 1st and for our next interviews as of yesterday we had 56 applications received through public safety testing which uh, is a lot um, relative to what we've been receiving through national testing network so that's where we are with police officers with code enforcement officers uh, council approved one additional position so we went from three to four uh, so first we filled behind Ashley Lamb who is now a police officer in the Academy and so um, Ari Pons was a record specialist applied for code enforcement officer and she was hired to fill behind Ashley Lamb and so we have one more the additional position to fill and we had a, have a person still on the hiring list that we're conducting the background on so if that background is successful then we'll be fully staffed in code enforcement if it's not then we will do another recruitment for code enforcement because that will expire our current list uh, with record specialists um, we now ha are filling in behind Ari Pons who became a code enforcement officer and so we held interviews February 21st to 22nd Barbara Ham Hammond sat in on those interviews and we're currently conducting a background on the top applicant from that testing. Um, we're anticipating another records vacancy uh, probably within five or six months. Uh, one of our records staff is, uh, has applied and accepted for law school. And so, uh, so we'll be able to use our current list uh, to fill behind that person. Uh, council, uh, approved to have a second commander position. Um, so we, Commander Chris Tennant is our operations commander and so we're creating a commander position to oversee operation, or I'm sorry, oversee support services, but primarily to take on a lot of administrative tasks that uh, we just don't have the capacity for at the moment. Um, so we're gonna hold off filling that position until we see how our hiring plays out and our patrol staffing and we wanna just make sure that our Patrol staffing is adequate, and we don't um, we don't have them go short to fill an administrative position. So that's on hold at the moment. We so that's uh, that's where we are staffing. Uh, we I don't remember if I covered this before, but we have a, uh, uh, a nationally known speaker coming to town to talk about. He's the author of the book Emotional Survival Survival for Law Enforcement. And he speaks nationally and internationally, so he's coming to Pullman on April 26th. And uh, we've invited all of the, um, anybody involved in any type of uh, first responder or crisis management type of a uh, uh, position in the region to that um, presentation. Where um, is that going to be? Here? It's going to be at Living Faith Fellowship. They have a, a, a large um, area that essentially has can hold over a thousand people so we don't have to have a cap on the number of people that we we have uh, coming to that can you repeat the title of the book it is called 
Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement, and the author is Dr. Kevin Gilmartin. Thank you. Uh, we've also arranged for someone who is a use of force expert that teaches uh, a lot of uh, different types of use of force training across the state to come to, uh, to Pullman Police Department in November. And he's going to provide training. The, the class name is Use of Force Transformative Practices for Trainers and Supervisors. And so it's, it's looking at training and uh, overseeing officers uh, in their use of force kind of in, in today's environment uh, with body-worn cameras and, um, uh, you know, and this is uh, related to the, um, the video that went viral um, and that just had, had a really bad optics. But um, so that's, the, that's what our officers uh, need to keep in mind, I think, when they, even though it's legitimate use of force, we, we also have to deal with public perception. And so uh, this trainer is going to present the training in a way that um, I think will be really good for officers to be able to have a really good understanding of all of the complexities involved now when they use force. Um, I previously reported that we are working on a strategic plan, and this is through the University of Washington Evans School of Public Policy and Governance. So we have three graduate students that are working on this. They were out here uh, February 25th and 26th to do external and internal stakeholder interviews. And uh, Darby and I meet with them weekly, and they'll be coming back um, in, later in April to do some more internal stakeholder interviews. Uh, and they should be wrapping up uh, by May. Uh, so by that time, I think they'll come back and do a presentation uh, on their final product and what the, about the strategic plan. <coughs> Excuse me. That's all I have. Any questions? Um, the administrative position you were talking about, that's on hold for now. Is it come out of your 33? It does, okay. yeah. It counts as one of the, the sworn positions. Oh. Yeah. So essentially, it's one of the three additional positions that council approved. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate okay. it. All right. No questions. Go on and move to our constituencies, Paul. My attraction. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right, Richard. Would you mind starting us off? Uh, it's not a constituent concern. Nobody's approached me, but it's my concern. What's going on with the district court? Are we going to have one in Pullman? Well, those uh, discussions are still going on. I know that they have a scheduled uh, council meeting April second. They're going to start an hour early and dedicate that whole hour to talking about that. So. Um, it's still uh, in flux. Uh, I don't think there any solution's been found yet, uh, but I know council's going to be discussing it on April 2nd. I sure think we need one here. <laughs> <coughs> That's all. Okay. <laughs> nothing to report? Okay. I have nothing. I just want to mention that uh, uh, the part of the Graduate and Professional Student Association, a group of uh, students have been to the uh, to Olympia in January 27 mm -hmm. for the Cook Day in the Capitol, mm -hmm. and it was a really uh, nice visit there and, you know, talking with the different legislature and uh, about different topics such, uh, such as the uh, research funding and uh, students' mental health and um, mental health concerns and services here in Pullman, so. Very cool. Yeah. I went on that three years ago, and oh, okay. it was a really good experience. Really good. Yeah, yeah, I've so been there. Too, I'm glad. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I mentioned that the uh, Graduate and Professional Students Association invited uh, Pullman PD and WSU PD to speak at a meeting last week. Uh, so um, I went, and Officer Don Daniels from WSU Police Department went, and we just um, uh, 
kind of did an overview of each of our departments and answered questions uh, for the uh, members of that association. Break, so I don't have anything. Except it's super quiet. <laughs> it's really nice. Um, well, along the line of spring break, Pullman um, School District will be on spring break the first week of April, and my daughter goes to DC for her school trip, first time away from her parents. We'll see how I am that week. <laughs> I was going to say, how is she going to be? But that's the wrong question. <laughs> um, but I had a question with the Pullman High School student. Mm -hmm. This uh, child of mine that I'm speaking of will be a high school student. Um, well, technically, come summer. Uh -huh. Can she can she apply to be yes. on here? Yes. Is there anything weird? No, there is that? nothing weird. We we <laughs> wanted we we want high school students here. So. In fact, I think David's son is also thinking of applying. Is that correct? Is his application he done? The application. Oh, okay. So we there. because we have a name on it. Oh, there might be competition now. <laughs> we, well, we have two if he positions wants to be the available. Main representative. <laughs> yeah, it could be. It'll be a competition to see who's the primary and. <laughs> Well, but she can't turn in her application until she's actually a high school student. She'll be right? next year. Yeah, he's going to head start. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why I kept looking at him like, go on. <laughs> How long has it been vacant since, I don't know. You, I don't know if I've ever seen anything. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's time. been a while. Jeff Hopbaker's son, is it Jeff? Um, Jeff Hobbaker's brother was on the police advisory committee. His son was here, and then he ended up, he graduated and went, went to the Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've had anyone since him. I don't think I've ever seen any student here. No, I'm not. I'm too new to know. I think so, my daughter Aiden could do it in about 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have two, so we just, you know, cycle through. <laughs> So, oh, is it my turn? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so, roosters, I'm pioneer, no, Sunnyside Hill, I can't remember what hill I live on. Uh, that's my only complaint, noise. Do you know where they're coming from? Yeah, it's actually a house that was complained about before across the street of Arrow Leaf Lane. Um, Do you know if it's an area that is zoned for that? Because that's, that's something we would check. I they mean, have you called the on it before? They got in trouble. They killed their rooster. And, oh. And, and, no. Now, oh, they, now they, they have they got more. Now they have more. <laughs> and my daughter is not sleeping, so now, I'm not if, happy. <laughs> if you have an address, you can call that in, and we'll check it because some places are not zoned for that. And okay. Yeah, it's in the Whispering Hills neighborhood, so I'm I'm not sure, but I think that they had gotten uh, in trouble. I don't know if it was from the Whispering Hills Association or not, but I don't want to complain. They're they're nice, great neighbors, but they. <laughs> Rooster is not so nice at what, four in the morning. Or? <laughs> no, no, and you, we, we gently said things to them, but they they just um, at least with the daylight savings time, the sun stays down longer now until summer yeah. time. Before now, <laughs> you can just go over there and just have some chicken soup. I, I'm a vegetarian, so that's not going to do any good. I am a vegetarian, but I really love your chicken. <laughs> We'll just take that one out of the YouTube <laughs> that, that one can be paused. <laughs> mm. uh, okay, so. Uh, um, nothing on my end. So. I have nothing to report. Eric, is, uh, I've not, I haven't asked this question yet. Has the new, the ATV ordinance, has that, have you seen a benefit from that uh, for your, <laughs> your people? Um, I would say we, um, in in the years past, we only once had issues, and we at that time it, yeah. dealt with resolved that. I really haven't seen anything. Because essentially, we've kind of turned our head and let everybody <laughs> operate, really, yeah. you know, uh, and I've, on the street without I've being been licensed. in touch with a few other snowplow people, and haven't they haven't had any. Issues. Yeah, I suspect so, there probably isn't much of a difference because we weren't really enforcing that. But uh, I think yeah. that it's good that it now they're doing it legally. Yeah. Yeah. That way, if there is, if there's an accident or something like that, yeah. then it doesn't put, extend your liability. Exactly. Right. So I do appreciate that being there. So. Yeah. So 
Do we have any public comment? Okay. All right. Well, next meeting is on April 8th, 2019. I can't believe it's about to be April. How exciting. Uh, I think we should move it. To act like. Move it. Yeah. Act like a <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so if uh, if you guys can work on, on getting your hair dryers out there, melting <laughs> some snow, we appreciate that. Do you want to talk about what presentation? Sure. Yeah. Have? We had. Uh, I don't have my list on me. The ones that I show left on the list are College Hill Association. Um, somebody to talk about the Dare program and school resource officer. Uh, and someone to talk about regional drugs has spent time on the regional drug task force and I would recommend another one that we could add to our list is to have um, Dr. Macon talk about some of the research that he's doing on body worn camera video analytics mm -hmm. the, new fellowship program. the new fellowship program we have about that and then uh, the calls for service so I think that's kind of interesting to have a comparison of uh, Moscow and Pullman and in Seattle to see what impact legalization of marijuana had on police resources and staffing issues. So, so most people look at it from a crime perspective, but we wanted to think about it from a resource perspective. So I'm pretty excited about that. And those are done. So we now, we show what happened in Pullman when you have legalization of marijuana. Wow, that's and great. And there's also a use of force research that you did. Yeah, using and use of force. I think we should uh, do those on um, a week after April 8th and a week after May whatever date and made that we're in. I'm so confused. What do you mean a week? Oh, because you can't I'm do Because I'm not going right. to be here. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing on April 8th? Um, oh, well, April 8th, we are renting out a uh, winery and having an event down in Vancouver. Oh, OK. okay. Um, right. well, then and I then May, <laughs> our, the May date, I'm in um, Ireland. OK, well. So. So both, both are forgiven as long as I see wine and whiskey. <laughs> so. <laughs> Since marijuana, marijuana came up, uh, I was watching a book notes presentation yesterday on the PD, and I don't have any idea if this is valid or not, but it was a, a big time, I can't remember his name, big time academic, and he was saying that Everything's going to hell with marijuana. It causes mental defects. It causes all kinds of problems. And we're missing the boat here. Uh, I wonder if some time we could have some WSU or law enforcement person or you know, that I have no idea. He was saying this is a big mistake to be legalizing marijuana state by state. Uh, I have no idea if he's accurate, inaccurate, whatever. But it, was a, it was a big time TV program. Yeah, it was probably Gladwell. He was in the Washington Post. And so it might great. be. I, I can't we remember. Remember Dale? I think Dale would love to come in. We just uh, finished an analysis of looking at violent crime. Yeah. Violent, you know, legalization of legalization. Yeah, that was another thing he was saying. Yeah. Violent crime is. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, we, uh, well, we, we could absolutely do a presentation on that. I'd like to hear that. I, I have no idea if he's accurate or inaccurate or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I haven't heard this stuff before. Yeah, we have that uh, mental health impacts, so we can. So we can book you the next three, four. Years. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be easy. I think it'd be. I mean, I think it'd be really interesting to see that. But I'd also really like to see because a lot of people say, you know, like alcohol. If you have too much alcohol, it really you know hurts your liver. What does marijuana do to your body? Like, what research has been done there? If well, that was you, another thing he was saying. Yeah. Doesn't it? again, I have no idea if he's accurate or not. Yeah. A lot of bad things. It'd be interesting to see like true research of what actually it does. Because we know what alcohol does, so now let's it's probably take 10, 40, 50 years before. Well I want it now. <laughs> <laughs> and statistically if it's still a gate it's still a gateway drug now that it's legal, you know, is it yeah. statistically that is it different statistically in that sense? I have a, a million questions on this <laughs> subject, so we can go on all day. Well, yeah, we we figure and we received a million dollars to study the impact. Well, let, yeah. let's do that. I, that. That's great. I think. I, if, if you're okay with that, uh, April meeting. So I, I believe that's a great idea to push it a week because I'll be at a Department of Justice event. I'm a keynote speaker. Well, so see, the I problem is with us moving our meetings is we are kind of slotted in at certain time periods, uh, with other boards and committees taking. May is perfect. We can do May. May. Okay. Uh, and then maybe was there one of that list that I mean. 
you could live without. <laughs> <laughs> Off the record. Well, I got, I got the coroner one. That was one of my, that was my topic okay. that I really wanted to see, so. Well, uh, I can read minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's YouTube. <laughs> That's right. Uh, maybe for, uh, do you have any new recommendations for which would be easiest to contact for the April or meeting? Or? Any of the, any, the College Hill Association, I'm sure, could probably come, and I could have Scott Patrick come and talk about Darren, School Resource Officer, mm -hmm. and I can have, uh, uh, there's a couple of people I could select to come talk about regional drug issues, so. Maybe we should uh, maybe try to get the regional drug issue topic covered, because I think it would be a good segue to his conversation in May. Are you guys? Okay with that. Unfortunately, you're gonna have to YouTube that one. That's okay. I'll be in Ireland and I'll I'll drink some whiskey, thinking of you guys. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Rub it in. Just, <laughs> That's right. just accommodate it's, the time. Yeah, and if if they're not available, maybe we could try I'll to put them onto the um, <laughs> June meeting and then put the dare. See if we can get that one at the April. Yeah, I'm mixing picture. everything up here. Like, am I saying the dates right? Does that sound okay to everyone? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Has anyone ever heard of that a show about a Lewiston uh, serial killer? That was from the 70s and 80s. No one's ever solved the murders and stuff. But it's interesting. I don't know if it's accurate or not. <laughs> Is this on Netflix special? Or? I don't think it's, no, it's not on Netflix. It's on like A&E or something. Okay. I saw cold, that. Cold case? Yeah, cold case. And I don't I know how accurate it is or not. In my head now. From my memory of those things happening, I mean, again, I don't know the intricacies of the accuracy, but it sounded very, very accurate okay. to me because I remember all of those events yeah. taking place. And I haven't watched all of them yet. I don't know what <laughs> yeah. Well, is it still on now? I we just recorded them. Oh, and how many were there? Because I saw like two. Yeah, I think there's four. Okay. Is this they happen one? like at Lewiston? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a soapin is what is where the first one happened, and then some girl riding her bike from <laughs> Moscow to Lewiston was taken and found, and then. Uh, Three other young people went missing uh, from Lew uh, Lewiston. <coughs> Civic Theater. Civic Theater, yeah. It's very interesting if you haven't. In, in What's the name of the series? Cold Case. <coughs> it's very. A and E. Yeah, if you want to look it up, it kind of hits yeah, the area. Like you'll, you. see, <laughs> you'll see the Snake River <laughs> and very familiar places on the show. So this is still unsolved. From what it sounds like, yeah, in the very beginning it says none of none of these murders have been solved. But I have also heard that they do have a suspect, <coughs> and they've had a suspect for years and years and years, but yeah. they didn't have enough evidence to, evidence to charge. But they know, they have a name and everything, and, and he lived like in the area. There. Well, I yeah, I I'm a little foggy. I think he's moved out of the area now, but but I don't know that for sure. But really interesting. <coughs> but there's no inside knowledge from the cheat. <laughs> That's the first I've heard of it because mm -hmm. I was in Southern California at the time. So. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting show. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to look it up. That's all I get. Well, thank you guys for a great meeting. And uh, our next meeting, we will have another speaker and we'll be talking more about our attendance policies where the three of us or four of us are going to meet up and talk about the changes I made and I had a couple other ideas so hopefully we'll have a good proposal for you guys at the next meeting on that. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> <laughs>